Hi, welcome to Chair Chats, the lifestyle talk show with the disability twist. I'm your host, Pauline Victoria. In this episode, we're going to talk with our guest about caregiving and her personal experiences with caregiving. Please welcome Ligia Andrade Zuniga. Thank you, Ligia, for joining us. Thank you for having me. This is exciting. I'm glad to share my knowledge with everyone. <laughs> We're happy to. Um, I'm a firm believer that we can learn from each other. So I feel like caregiving is such a huge part of many of our lives. Um, for us to be able to do what we do in life, to be independent as possible, they're a great support. But I also believe that there are certain things that um, we need to take into consideration when we're hiring a caregiver and maintaining a relationship with a caregiver that will help make it successful. So I want to thank you for opening up your experiences to us and um, sharing that. So let's just start by asking you uh, if you can tell us a little bit about what your disability is and how long you've had experience with caregivers. So I have a, a C5, C6 complete spinal cord injury. So I am paralyzed from my chest down, from my elbows down to my hands. Um, and I don't have any, like, well, because I'm paralyzed from my elbows down to my hands, I have no control of my hands. Um, they don't work at all. And so I need serious help with everything. Um, I've been using a caregiver for about 10 years now. What have been some of your not so good experiences, um, with caregivers? Well, you know, and I'm not exaggerating. I've been through about, say, 150 people in my entire disabled life. Yeah, some have lasted a day. Some have not even shown up for work. Some have lasted years. Um, some I still have. You know, some um, have left because they've moved away or because they've gotten other jobs. Um, some I've had to fire. And some, a couple of them are, well, one of them was my mom and one of them was my brother. So like I've, I've tried many different types of care. So my horror stories are, I had the one girl that always stands out to me. She was really, um, she was very irresponsible and a little just out there with her, just her openness with her life. I, I needed her to show up to my house about six o'clock. And I needed to take a shower and do uh, my personal care and things like that, which takes three or four hours. She didn't show up to my house till about 11 o'clock because she couldn't find a ride. But when you know you have to work, <laughs> you figure out your transportation beforehand. So when she told me she got to my house, um, she was really, um, I don't know, she was really just all frazzled, you know, not really present. Um, and then she shared with me that she had to perform a sexual act to get to my house that day. <laughs> yeah, which was interesting. So she was um, fired immediately. <laughs> but she also didn't pay attention. And with my shower chair, you have to always pull me and push me from the front so I don't fall out because I have no trunk control. Um, well, she pushed it from the back and I fell out of the chair. And yeah, it was at least like a couple feet and um, hit my face on the floor. I was completely naked. And so it was very, it was embarrassing. And so um, that was in front of my roommate's caregiver. And then my, we were training her with another person. Thank God they were around because they were able to like pick me up and put me in bed. Um, she ran. She like didn't even pick me up. She just left me there and ran and locked herself in the bathroom. Just really interesting, yeah. Was like wow. Yeah, so that was, and I got, I had like a, I really, but I think I got, I think I got kind of, I don't know, I was so, I was so shocked, you know. Um, so yeah, so that's one of my experiences. Like I, I want people to feel comfortable here, you know, and I want them to know that I appreciate their help. Um, but there's times when it's, you know, you have to assert what you need, 
you know, and assert the respect. So this woman was, she would argue with me about everything. And um, I would have to tell her, look, I don't want to argue with you. Like, I, it's very, this is already very, um, very personal. You know, and that's just awkward to have this awkward relationship. You know, what do you say? What do you do? Um, so she, I had a standing frame. And, um, and this is just one example. There were like a million with her. But um, she pumped the standing frame up too fast and too hard, where she cranked it far. And it was an old standing frame, and she broke it. And these things are not cheap, you know. So then I said, you broke it. She said, no, I didn't. I'm like, but you're holding the handle, and it's off. And you're like, you broke it. She's like, well, it's not my fault you have old things in your house. Yeah. So um, I demanded that she replaced it because... I, my standing frame is very important to me. <laughs> um, it's very conducive to my health and she refused, but it was just nuts. Like she broke other things. She um, would say the weirdest things. Um, she would lie about like all of her, all of her professional um, experiences. Um, she was just kind of really, she was really strange. Um, I've had people steal from me. Um, people like don't show up, just don't call, um, or show up like an hour too late. It's just I don't know. I feel like people don't take this seriously. They don't take it as a normal job. They think that um, because I don't know because it's care that it's not real. I'm sure there's others. <laughs> well, the other thing too is like we were talking about having you know a spouse or someone helping you and that's very hard my partner also helps me a lot so he's also a quad but he's more functional than I am so he can cook and clean and drive me around and <laughs> do stuff for me um so like if somebody doesn't show up it falls on him too because then he can't go to work on time or um, he has to call in sick because he needs to stay with me because at that point my um I can't like drink water or roll over or empty my lit my urine bag or anything without anyone, you know. So he stays behind and tries to do the best he can for me. Um, but it's hard because we say, like, I don't. I always, I always try to like thank him, you know, for what he's doing for me because it's, it's uh, not that like in a relationship you help each other, you know. But it's not his responsibility if I've hired someone to do this and they're the ones that are supposed to do it and they just don't show up. And it's not fair to him to have to cancel appointments with clients and stay home with me. It's not fair, you know, or my mom having to call her at the last minute. Your care, like your relationship with that person is like you already have an established relationship before you have an injury like this. And so that relationship and then adding care on top of that, it makes it not only a little bit more stressful, um, but that relationship is like that, that normal uh, interaction with that person is also involved. So like if you've had a combative relationship with that person or a, um, like if it's strained in any way, that still will seep into them, into what's going on at the present moment. So like, not that my mom and I have a bad relationship because we don't, but it's a mother-daughter thing, you know, it's the bigger or, you know, she thinks she knows best, which is, it's funny because so do I, my kids. But, uh, but that's different because I do. No, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Um, but with her, you know, it's, we don't see eye to eye all the time. And so that was very hard. Very, very hard experiences. And then I've got my boys. Um, my boys were 11 and 6 when they were when I was injured. And so, um, you know, like our culture is very unified. So, like our families, um, we do things for each other in our families. Um, so, like with my kids, they became instant caregivers in the sense that if we were together 
and I needed something to drink or eat. They needed to do that for me. Um, I have a super pubic catheter, so my I have a urine bag that drains um, the urine from the tube in my stomach. So that fills up, and so they'd have to empty it. You know, and on the one hand, they learned a lot because this is what people, what some of us have to deal with, you know, or have to go through every day, and that's good. I, I wanted, I'm glad, like it changed their mentality. They're very helpful, and they understand disability, but, you know, they still were kids, you know. So that was a very difficult situation, because I, not only as a mom, you, can, you constantly have this stupid mom guilt, <laughs> but now it's even more so because of that, you know. Am I doing the right thing? Should I just ask them for help? Um, is, this, should, is this okay for a kid to be doing, you know? But at the same time, it's like we have no choice. We have to help each other. So um, that's hard. Yeah. 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 No, I have a son myself. So having to define where the boundaries are, this is okay to help me with, this is not okay to help me with. Right. That's really right. important. Um, yeah. But that, that's why it makes it even so much more important for us to bring in outside help. Uh, because we don't want to have to put our family in a position where there are ca primary caregivers because it changes the dynamics of, of your relationship. And I really appreciate what you said about, um, you know, having a relationship already established, like with your mom or your brother, but then you have to almost redefine that if they come in as your caregiver. Right. Um, and so that that's very hard. I mean, I think... For myself, having to do that with my husband, um, you know, it's important to set those boundaries that he's my husband and not my caregiver. Of course, if, right. any, if you guys right. need help with each other, you guys help each other out, you know, like, I'll pick something up at the store for him. I can do that. He'll make dinner. He can do that, you know. So, yeah, it, it's just, it's a different way of caring for each other. But I do think it is important uh, for the sake of the health of our relationships that we have outside caregivers who are separate from those personal relationships. The reason I wanted to start with the horror stories is because um, even though they're bad, we can learn a lot from them. We learn very quickly what is important to look at in terms of do I hire this caregiver? Um, I get sometimes we're in a hard place and we just have to accept whoever the agency sends at the moment because maybe our regular person is sick or they went on vacation or whatever happened, their car broke down. Um, but for the most part, when we are able to hire somebody, um, based on your bad experiences and what you've learned from them, are there certain uh, qualities that you look for in a caregiver? And if so, how do you um, learn about those qualities, say in an interview, what questions do you ask? Once somebody is late for the interview, I already feel that if, you're, if you're, you can't be on time for a job interview, then you probably are not gonna be on time for work. Um, I really go with my gut. If I meet someone and there's any reservation that I have at all, I have to go with that feeling because I've done it before where I, I try to say, oh, I'll just give them the benefit of the doubt or, oh, you know, it's okay. It never works out. Never, never. So I really like go by my intuition. Um, also, if I've asked them to bring something to, to the interview and they don't. So I always ask them to bring references because I want to see, and a resume, because I want to see if they take this seriously. And most of the time, people do not. And so that really already, as well, makes them feel like, well, you're not taking this seriously. Um, whether they look at me in the eye or not. If I've met someone and they can't look at me in the eye and say hello or shake my hand, there's something going on. I try to ask them a lot of questions about what their lifestyle is like, although it doesn't, um, it, it really, like, I don't know, I, you have to be careful because, for example, like if they have kids or things like that, 
you don't want to come off as like discriminatory, you know, because like I have kids, I've worked, I get it, you know, things happen. But this is a different type of situation where if you don't show up, things just won't get done, you know, and it, it's not like, oh, I can just leave it. No, this is a human being, you know. So if they have children and things like that, um, I try to understand like what, what they, like what type of, um, like how they live their life for their kids or lifestyle. So I'm like, so what happens when your kids, you know, when your kids get sick or um, what, like who, who takes them to school or um, like, what is your schedule like with them, you know, or whatever it is, or with your family members, say they're taking care of a family member or say with their other jobs, you know, or um, I really need to understand what their life is like so I can see if it's going to be a fit with mine. I also go by um, their professionalism and how they, like how they're dressed and how they communicate um, at the interview. If they answer my questions, um, I ask them about their experience, obviously, but I, I don't really, I've hired people with no experience and it work, it's worked out fine because I can teach them as long as they're willing to learn. And I, I don't have a preference on the age or gender, well, gender in certain situations, um, because I have to, like, have someone do my hair and my makeup and stuff, <laughs> so it really depends, you know, if they've, because there's, there's been men that know how to do all that, you know, but, so I just kind of see what, um, their experiences are, what they're willing to do and not to do, um, I'm very, very detailed and very clear in the, in the phone process, so what I do first is I, um, um, I get their information, then I do a phone sort of screening, um, what their schedule is like, how it's going to fit, what they've done, tell them all about the job. Um, in my ads, I'm very detailed because I don't want any surprises. Um, then we meet for an interview, and I repeat everything all over again. I repeat it on the phone, and then I repeat it again in person. I, like I, again, I, I try to be very, very, very specific and very, very clear and what I need. Um, if they fly through the interview, I ask for their references, I call their references, they come out great, then I will call them back and have them start training. So in the training, um, if I see that they're attentive and they're paying attention to what's going on, if they're like willing to like to ask questions and, and understand, then it's going to work out. Um, but oftentimes, when they're not paying attention and when they're just like, mm, it usually doesn't work out. Do you know with a certain in a certain period of time that oh, okay, this is not going to work out? Oh yeah, you can feel it. Like when they start calling in sick, or when they start showing up late, or um, when they start not really caring about the like not the relationship but about the job. They're like, eh. Or they start to like become very forgetful or depend on me to tell them what to do next. Yeah, mm -hmm. that becomes a problem when people get too comfortable. How do you balance that with them in terms of being friends and also maintaining a professional relationship? I mean, it depends on every person. So I've had people um, that they've been referred to from a friend. So that's, it becomes a little more personal that way. Um, people that I don't know very well, I, I, I don't mind, you know, getting friendly with people, um, but I do have to, to keep sort of a boundary of what I share um, with my own life, um, what I allow them to share. I don't ask really any personal questions, um, like too personal. Maybe like, how's your mom? How's your family? How's um, your, how are your kids, you know, or um, maybe like, oh, what are you doing this weekend, you know, but like I try not to do too much because their level of respect changes. In the training of a canoe caregiver, are there certain techniques that you use to make it very clear or allow the process of learning to be more successful? Since the first day they come, they just observe, really. And they write down whatever's going on. The next time they, they come and train, 
they're going to do half of the work. Um, so they can, because people, a lot of people just learn by doing. So then they start doing half of the work. And then the next time they come, they're going to do it on their own. But with the, with the person helping me train them, present. Um, and I don't like to leave them until they're actually really comfortable because there's certain things that can be dangerous, like the transfers, um, showers, things like that. Um, personal care. I really try to like encourage them to feel um, confident in how they're doing things. So, you know, I like to, to kind of praise them and they're doing something correctly. But I, I like to show technique a lot. How do you manage your emotions when a caregiver that you've had for a while and you're very in sync with has to leave and you have to train someone new? There's always a level of anxiety when I'm with someone for the first time and they have to help me shower or do my bowel care because it's so intimate or helping me get dressed because it's so intimate. So there's always a level of anxiety and a level of insecurity. I'm um, not insecurity in myself, but insecurity in the situation um, because I don't know them that well. Over time you get, it's because it's a new routine, you know, it's like a new situation. So there's always that getting used to. Do you have an evaluation process that you go through on a regular basis with caregivers? If you do, how often do you uh, go through that evaluation process and what does that look like? I don't have a formal evaluation process, which I probably should, um, but it's, I just kind of play it by ear on how things are going. Usually if it's not like if someone's not feeling the job or if they're not like uh, picking it up, they, they usually leave on their own. After a year, I try to give them a raise um, if they're doing well. Would you suggest that people do have an evaluation process? I, I would. You know, it's like trying to ask a lot of questions to see if they, um, to see if, if, it's, if it's a fit. I do do a background check and fingerprints. Um, because I go through in-home support services, so they automatically do a fingerprint background check through the DOJ. But unfortunately, it's only for the state of California. So if they've committed a crime outside of California, it doesn't pick that up. It's a little scary. This is more of a systemic question uh, regarding the pay that caregivers are given. Um, you live in California. It's very expensive to live in California. And I don't know what the minimum wage is there or how much the in-home support services system pays their caregivers. Um, I know in Hawaii, it's very low, the, the mm -hmm. amount of money that direct support workers generally are, are paid. Um, do you feel like that influences the quality of people that are offered to you as potential caregivers? On the provider side, um, one thing that definitely affects everybody is the pay. It's $13.90 an hour. That's ridiculous. The minimum wage, I believe, is $15. And when you have someone doing such important work, that they can, I mean, this is a human being. $13.90 an hour is ridiculous. I think LA County pays like $10, something like that. San Francisco pays 15. So each county absorbs the difference of how much they want to pay their, their caregivers. Because the state pays like, it looks like something like 12 something. And so any more, the state has to absorb it themselves. There are so many issues, right? Care is very, very important right now because there's all also a huge aging population that's coming up. Um, we compete. So sometimes the difficult part is that the retirees that are able to pay $35 an hour for someone to sit with them, <laughs> it makes it hard for us because I can't afford $35 an hour to have someone be my friend. You know, I need them to actually work. So when they come over, they're like, well, I can't, I don't do all that stuff, you know, and I'm like, well, what do you do? Well, I just sit with them. That's ridiculous. <laughs> with the pay, like I really try to compensate people according to their experience and according to how long they've been with me. Um, I do try my best to like, to acknowledge that. I, I, I really need to be able to show people that they're appreciated.
and that this is a job that they can um, feel comfortable that they're able to pay their bills and they're able to survive um, because I just don't think it's fair. Yes, I think uh, the caregiving business, <laughs> it needs um, a lot of improvement. <laughs> and it would be nice to have yeah. a platform for uh, caregivers and recipients to, to be able to have a dialogue. Um, so I, I think that, that's really good. What advice would you impart to people that are just approaching having to get caregivers? Just to remember that this is your care. It's your life. And you need to drive that. Then get some help from someone else that, um, that is part of that program for, um, to learn how to do with your hours. Because we only get a set uh, you know, amount of hours. Um, I try to show people how to maximize that and like what to do to be able to get what they need with however many hours they have. Um, with that too, remember that they have the power to file grievances, that they can advocate for themselves if they don't know how, get some help, go to the Centers for Independent Living, or um, get just an advocate or somebody to help you navigate that system if you don't know how. Um, also, just create a plan, like make sure you're very clear about what you need. Not only is it does it show um, that this is professional job um, it also creates a structure um, and to but to be careful to stay within those those structures be mindful of um, their time if they're off at five make sure they're off at five follow your intuition follow your gut if you feel like something's not right it's not right thank you Lihia for sharing your experiences I think from our conversation to summarize the tips that you gave, they are one, to set the expectations clearly with our caregivers from the beginning, two, keep the communication lines open, three, to show respect to our caregivers with their time and their energy, and hopefully they do the same, and four, to follow your gut. I believe our intuition is often forgotten but it does play an important role when we have to choose the people we let into our lives. I also believe that in sharing there is power. If you have had an experience with a caregiver, good or bad, we wanna hear from you. And we wanna hear what lessons did you learn from those experiences. Thank you so much for commenting below and for subscribing and sharing. And if you'd like to see more content like this from One Leg Up Productions, please support us at patreon.com forward slash One Leg Up Productions. Thanks so much and be blessed.